Hey, this is Nicole calling from Hamilton, and I needed to let everyone know that I really proudly support Vish and creative control. I have for many years, I will for many more, as long as he keeps delivering these amazing interview podcasts. When you hear one of Vish's interviews, you think he's known this guest for years, they're good friends. Uh, but the truth is, he approaches every interview, whether it's sort of up and coming indie artists or established icons or like famous intimidating comedians with. Uh, a really deep, genuine curiosity, so he's never met this person, and the same really warm uh, candor, as so he's known them forever. I think it really lends to a great chat, no matter who he's talking to, and for that reason, I think you should throw Vish, like what, a dollar a month? He's got jokes. The jokes make it worth it. Support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife, and remember, when you name a dog Janet or Timothy, you are dragging humanity down just a little bit. Caribou is the performing name of Dan Snaith, who originally hails from Dundas, Ontario. Currently and seemingly permanently based in London, England, Snaith is a pioneering and influential figure in the realms of electronic, hip-hop, dance, and psychedelic rock music. His latest album is a wondrous one called Suddenly, which is out now via both Merge and City Slang Records. And Dan and I had a chance to catch up and discuss living in England after Brexit, the dramatic birth of his daughter, the prominent use of his own voice and themes of loss and communication on Suddenly, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 530th episode of Creative Control featuring the brilliant Caribou with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Dan. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. It's nice to speak with you again. I feel like it's been too long since we we spoke and i've seen you i used to i feel like that used to happen more frequently dan are you mad at me you're not mad at me are you no this is entirely my fault uh you might have noticed that my albums are getting more and more spaced out so the the occasion when we get to the occasions when we get to talk it's getting more and more um yeah the gaps are getting bigger unfortunately that's i apologize no no it's please don't apologize but on that note uh, what what's with the spacing? Why why are you why are we spacing out Caribou albums? And I I'm throwing we into it because I feel involved somehow now that you. <laughs> <laughs> why why are the Caribou albums taking a bit longer to come out? Well, if, if you're gonna say we, maybe I can shift a little bit of the blame back onto you. <laughs> it um, is kind of my fault. I agree. <laughs> You haven't been demanding a new one enough. I'm waiting for people to be clamorous enough that I feel like I've got to make... Anyway, uh, I guess that there's kind of two answers. One is that I've got, I'm older and I've got kids and there are more things going on in my life that take up my time. Uh, and so, you know, when I was 25 years old, I spent every waking minute of my life in making music. And so I'd get things done more quickly. But that's a bit of a lie because you also know that I was doing a math PhD at the time. So mm -hmm. uh, how did I get so much done? I don't, I don't know. But the other the other thing is I think, and I think this is more honest to be more reflects how I what I feel the real answer is, is that I've I've made a lot of music now, and I don't want to feel like I'm repeating myself, and I want to feel like the music that I make adds something to the music that I've made, and since there's you know. It, you know, I've kind of recorded a lot of ideas um, over the years and to find an, a way of kind of doing something new within the same kind of musical vocabulary that's that's in me somewhere uh, requires it like just mining it more, like looking deeper, being more kind of inventive. It, it, and it manifests itself in making 
way more of these kind of rough draft ideas. I made over 900 draft ideas for tracks for this record, whereas the last one was like 600 and the one before was 400. Uh, and I'm just, I just won't give up until I'm 100% happy with it. So that ends up taking more time, I think. Is there, there's going to be people listening to what you just said and assume that might be hyperbole. 400 songs for an album, 900 songs or tracks for an album that, you know, it's ended up being, what is it, 12? Is, is what yeah. we're hearing? Is it, how, is that true? Is it 900 finished songs no it's okay it's not it's not so every day i i i'm in the studio you know uh weekdays anyway and i make like a kind of 30 second loop with maybe a beat and some chords over the top and a melody and a couple other ideas maybe and then i move on to something else and i'm making no attempt to kind of finish things at that point i'm just kind of capturing an idea not just something that comes up in the moment of making it spontaneously not something that i've like thought of prior to that but just something that comes to me while I'm in the studio and I those things just kind of accumulate and that process is something that I've always my that's my favorite bit really is starting from nothing and that part's always easy coming up with something it most of the time that something is not very good or not very interesting or something I've done before etc 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 but and then the process for me is like making a bunch of those somethings and then eventually I've got a few hundred of, you know if you, if I do that every day yeah and I make a couple of them a day, they start to pile up really quickly. And uh, and then I'm looking back all over all these things and being like, okay, which of these things has some kind of something new, something interesting, something that catches my ear, like a melody that is, that is uh, like sticks in my head or what, what do I, some, you know, it gets to the point where of, of these 900 tracks, which are, well, ideas for tracks, which are in a playlist on my computer, I'll go back to them at the end, you know, and they've been there, been accumulating over the last six years. And there's ones that I literally do not remember making at all. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I just don't remember them. They were, and uh, and it's probably better. A lot of them, it's better than I don't remember them. But <laughs> uh, but yeah. So and then it's a question of this. I guess this has always been my process. And lots of people just write the songs that are going to go on their album. But for me, it's kind of an exploration. So this is how it works for me, I guess. Okay. Now, I want to dive a bit deeper into what you were just saying in relation to this uh, beautiful, but beautiful new album, Suddenly. Congratulations on this, if I might say, Dan. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Now, the last time we spoke, uh, either on the phone or maybe I texted you, I think the number was uh, based in uh, London. Are you, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here still. Uh, that's where I'm talking to you from, from my house here. I've, yeah, we've. I mean, it's getting to this weird point actually, where I mean, I still, I was talking to another Canadian friend who lives here. A lot of my friends are like the Canadian friends that I met in Toronto when I was at University of Toronto, or even people that I grew up with in Dundas uh, that now live in London. And we were th- remarking on how weird it is, how long we've lived here, how we still feel very much Canadian and not like we still feel like foreigners here even though I kind of I also have a British passport my parents were British Hmm. but it's like it's almost half of my life that I've been here now which is very odd to me that thought but uh, I mean the as much as anything there's just a kind of inertia and things that accumulates my kids are in school here now you know that moving would be like a we've definitely as you can imagine, living in Brexit, Britain. Oh yeah, the idea yeah. the idea of moving back to Canada has occurred to us several times over the last few years. Um, but it's more of an upheaval than it used to. It used to be just me and my wife, and we'd just be like, "Well, we could live anywhere, you know. I could do this anywhere." Um, and now there's this kind of more, more uh, you know, my parents also who moved to Canada before I was born, and then moved back when their parents were elderly to the UK. Well, now they're elderly right. and they're here and, and they need me around them. And, you know, so so there's lots of those kind of things. OK, uh, just to, to touch upon what you just brought up, uh, it's not often I get to speak to kind of a, a firsthand witness to what Brexit might be about. Uh, are you feeling the implications already? Uh, what, what is your sense of what's to come? I, I already there was a report that. Uh, you know, as a British citizen, you're going to need a passport to tour around Europe. I'm, I know that impacts you. Uh, how are you feeling about things? You, you, I mean, obviously, you say you contemplated leaving, so you can't be feeling all that great. But now that it's really happening, uh, how do you feel? 
No, it, it has been a depressing place to live in the last few years. Uh, but not so, I mean, that yes, there are bureaucratic things and ex- things that will have an expense. You know, they've now just announced that in order to get a work permit here, Europeans will have to prove they have a certain amount of money. You know, a musician coming to do a few shows or do a show in London will have to prove they have a certain amount of money in their bank account. And that won't affect me, but it makes me angry that that's the kind of climate that, you know, like that kind of requirements put upon people just starting out. It'll kind of stop that cold. Um, But for me, it's more about, I don't know, and this really is something that I reflect upon having had such a wonderful and affirming and kind of positive experience growing up in Canada and thinking we live in a world that is kind of gradually getting better and uh, things are improving and a kind of a kind of compassionate and progressive conception of the world will eventually, you know, it, th- there is a, there's an arrow that progress is pointing, a direction that progress is pointing in. And, you know, there may be bumps along the path, but we're headed in that direction. And not only in Britain, obviously, you know, I mean, I'm sure listening to this, you can think of other examples sure. of countries in the world where that's the case. But but that sense of of a direction that things are headed, that things are improving for the better, man, that has been called into question over and over again. And that's the thing that, you know, when just the shock of a kind of vote for Brexit, winning a majority of votes in this country, I realized, A, kind of how much of a bubble I live inside yeah. in London, but also just... Um, it's just it's just sad that that kind of rhetoric has been compelling and convincing and and also that it kind of underlines the kind of divisions in society, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and it's happening all over the world. It's not simply in in England. Uh, I mean, I know that you you mentioned you've been in London more almost or what was it almost or more than half your life now. Uh, your family is there. Your new album is called Suddenly, and I recently came upon a story about how one of your children was born. And it seemed to be sudden. Uh, I wonder if there if yep. that is an allusion to that. There's a lot going on in this record, and we're going to talk about it. But this notion of, uh, I mean, first of all, can you tell that story? Because yeah, it, it seems like quite an adventure yes. you had. Uh, but also, is it is that related in any way? To the album you, title and to yes, the... Yes, to the to album the title. mood yeah. of the album. Yeah, I mean, it's this album has taken five and a bit years. So there, every kind of mood is captured in that time. And, you know, if I'm making music every day, there's lots of different moods. And the kind of having a new... The last album that I made, Our Love, was kind of when I had we had our first child. And, uh, you know, that's something special. And the whole world kind of seems new again. Uh, but again, we had a ch- child during the making of this album, which is very joyful and euphoric but the way it came about was uh unusual i guess in that we uh well she was born on on to a very busy street in london i mean like pulling pulling over a car and she was born in the middle of the day like people shouting at parking attendants and people drinking espresso at a little cafe but you know on the side <laughs> of the road you know people unloading a refrigerator or whatever it was it's like that kind of a big busy street and we just did not make it to the hospital in time we kind of um fortunately very fortunately we'd um hired a midwife a doula to who worked at a hospital to come and we don't even have a car right. so the question was like how to get to this hospital um and she arrived at our house having worked a shift i'd been texting her all day like are you coming soon is it what's <laughs> you know are you nearly done work and when she arrived she took one look at my wife and said I just saw her face fall and she was like, we need to go now. And uh, we just didn't make it. But weirdly, that was like we, she, uh, our daughter was born like the the instant the car was pulled over. It was like you pull over the car. This is happening right now. She ran around, delivered our daughter and handed it to handed her to my wife. And then we were all laughing and crying simultaneously. But it was really joyous moment. It was incredibly, uh, you know, the the kind of. The the fact that it was in a car all of a sudden didn't matter at all. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, it was quite a moment. Yeah, I it's similar to my this the the birth of my second child. My daughter was sort of similar. We I it was in our both kids of, of mine were born in our living room, and the, for some reason the second one just wanted to get the hell out of there and just shoot, yeah. just like the midwife showed up at the last second. You know, we called it was the middle of the night. 
And I had to more, I was about to catch my daughter and then this midwife just stormed in, dropped everything. You know, this wasn't up to code. I think they're supposed to do a bunch of stuff, but she just like, <laughs> right. just caught my daughter. And uh, yeah, it was a momentous and strange, it went from fear and panic to just jubilation uh, all within a yep. second. I, I imagine that's what you felt. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a common experience that the first, our first it was a long, long process the first time around, and the next time around, it was like, oh, I didn't expect it would be that, that quick. <laughs> exactly, yeah. The first experience doesn't really teach you that much about the second. I mean, in a sense it does, but it just happens much more quickly. Um, and yeah, I, I what I meant to tell you there, as, as you were talking about London, is uh, I don't know if you know this, but I moved to Edmonton. I don't live in Guelph anymore. Hmm. I live in Edmonton, Alberta. No yeah. way. I, I, did, I did not know that. Yeah, I was going to ask, actually. If you're, Yeah, how do you like living in Edmonton? It's it's okay. It's all right. I'm still trying to figure it out. We're, we're staying with my wife's parents for now, and uh, it's good. But I, it does make me envious when I look at your tour schedule. Uh, it makes me envious because I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't see Edmonton on there. Are you planning to be in Alberta at some point? Yes, you know that. I mean, I well, I don't, maybe you don't know, but uh, people who live in the prairies know, like, I'm, I'm, want to make sure that we make it to the prairies because we always have amazing shows playing across the prairies and and also i've got to say that this is a makes me chuckle a little bit we'll kind of announce the first run of dates and people are like what are you talking about you're not coming to this and i'm just like hang on guys you know how this works like <laughs> things get planned you know in a s- sequentially and we i honestly like we're these aren't going to be the only shows um so i don't we don't have um, specific plans yet to be the get to the prairies. Okay, um, but I uh, I would be very sad if we did not. So yeah, and no, I didn't mean to badger as well. I'm just I'm just saying that's when you're when you put yourself in, like you've probably had that. You've been in, I mean you're in London. People come and play London, of course. But you must look some every once in a while when you first moved. You must have been like ah, oh, I'm missing stuff happening in Ontario that I would normally. Oh have. sure, yeah. It's just it's yeah. nor- it's normal. Now, you, yeah, you, sure. you said something about uh, your work as an artist and how you need to kind of change things up to sort of please yourself a little bit. And suddenly it does seem uh, different on some level. Your voice is more prominent. Is that fair to say? Do you, It feels like you're using your voice and singing in a, in a more prominent role to me. Is that fair? Oh, for sure. I mean, and yeah, I think it comes out of the fact that I'm singing about things that are more personal to me, more specific, really very much more specific. And so it just didn't feel like I could, well, first of all, they were all, I had to sing all the songs, you know, they, they weren't things that I could be like, oh, I wonder who would be a good singer to sing this song. Hmm. No, they were, they were about things happening in my life. So I felt like I had to sing them. And also they didn't feel like things that I should be kind of shrouding in lots of layers and reverb and echo and stuff like that it, it, it always when i would try that i'd be it just wouldn't wouldn't make sense in my mind with the kind of subject matter being so personal and intimate a lot of the time not always obviously but uh, but um yeah a lot of the songs have that character how autobiographical are these songs because you know we we just were telling the story about the birth of your your daughter uh in the car and i think of you as a a, a happy, stable family man <laughs> on some level. Yep. But at the same time, when I listen to the songs and pour, think about the lyrics, there seem to be a lot of, you know, ruminations about loss, lost love. When I think of a song like "Like I Loved You um, or or Magpie, there's someone named Julia is mentioned as, as someone from the past. So I wonder if, if it's autobiographical, a reflection upon a different period. In, if, if so, if it's a different period in your life or... Are you employing narrative devices here? Are you creating? A, are you a, are you playing a character on some level? So I'm just curious. How? Let's start with this. How autobiographical would you say this record is? So a lot of times in the last five years, and you're right. I am a happy, stable family man. That is a very good description of me. I think <laughs> good. Um, and a kind of optimist. You know, I'm a, like a person who's always sees the the good in things or the positive in things. But in the last five years. Things that have affected me, but also uh, this is what the title refers to really is like there have been these kind of big cataclysmic, often traumatic changes in my family, not, you know, and kind of intergenerational family, my parents, my siblings, my wife's family that I've, we've been I've been part of her family for 20 years mm-hmm. now um, that have just are partly a consequence of my age, but also just, yeah, really unfortunate things. My wife. My wife's brother died of a heart attack at the age of 50. Mm. 
my dad, we're very fortunate. Both of our parents are still alive. Uh, but my dad went through a health crisis that made me wonder, like, you know, how have I not considered that this is something that I'm taking for granted? And it wasn't at all for sure how much longer we'd have together. Julia is about uh, our sound engineer. That's I don't I could, that's a a longish story, but I can uh, depends if you want to hear it or or not. Of course, um, no, go ahead. Of course. So we met um, Julia, uh, who was started being our sound engineer in two thousand and five, uh, and presented at that point as a man uh, had lived as a in terms of presentation as a man, uh, and we toured together for. Uh, I guess like five or six years, a lot. Like we spent a lot, a lot of time together, became really close friends. And then just as we were about to do the tour for Swim, she emailed and said, listen, guys, I have something to tell you. I'm trans. I've real. I've known this since I was uh, a kid in the like early 60s in Britain when this was, you know, not a th- even a thing really that was understood in any way, or let alone being part of a kind of cultural conversation. Uh, and I finally, at age of 50, have decided to transition and, uh, you know, uh, be present as a woman, be my true self as a woman. Hmm. Um, and so we had we and and also I'm doing that during this tour that we're going on together. Oh, a big, I see. A, big, a big North American tour in places like Kansas, Texas, where being trans and like her her decision to be like, am I going to. Okay, oh, we're crossing mm-hmm. we're crossing the border in North Dakota today. Am I going to present as a man or am, am I going to present as a woman because we're going to be dealing with a border guard and they're going to be looking at my passport or at a kind of truck stop in a r- rural place where there's a real danger involved in being trans, mm-hmm. like a physical danger. Uh and so we went through that experience and man that was such an incredible education and we became closer she became closer with all of us the whole band out of the process of that and it was such a wonderful affirming thing but then very tragically like a couple of years later I got a call from a friend have you heard from Julia she's in hospital she got a super aggressive cancer and was here in London in hospital, and I was with her the night before she died in oh, the no. hospital. Like with, within oh, the ca- within the course of like three weeks diagnosis to uh, her passing away. Um, I'm so sorry. So this, I'm so sorry, Dan. I I th- bl- thank you. I believe I met Julia when you played Guelph, actually. Yeah, yeah, you did. I'm sure you did. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so the, and this was in so the, this has happened a while ago. This uh, she actually passed away um, in 2014, and I named a track on the last record after her, mm-hmm. but it wasn't it, it was already done, so it wasn't about her. So this track is like a letter to her, and it's a kind of a letter. In the the. the I I just wish I'm not a kind of spiritual person. I don't think I can actually communicate with her in any sense. But the kind of degree to which, obviously still beset with lots of difficulties, but the degree to which the conversation around trans rights has progressed enormously in that time since she passed away, I just wish she'd been here to see that. Yeah. That would have meant so much to her. So, and But also, I mean, you know, she was like a, tough old lefty so like also like Trump would be etc Brexit etc would be driving her insane at the mm-hmm. moment uh, so it's like a it's a letter like communicating all those things to her that song you you said something there uh, that struck me beyond all the the touching words about Julia and I appreciate them and I'm like again I, I'm sorry for your loss losses there um, but you said something about how you're not really a spiritual person but there's a few references here that I wanted to ask you about. In the song, You and I, mm-hmm. that one of the verses, I believe, goes along. It's something like, you can take your place up in the sky. I will find a way to carry on down here. Just as long as you are near, we can only make it if we try. There's a reason that you left us all down here. So I thought, oh, this is a more overt or spiritual or religious kind of lyric than we usually hear from Dan. Yep. And so I wondered if you had sort of had a moment where you maybe uh, were embracing your spirituality or religion more in some ways. Yeah, so you've interpreted those words 100% correctly. 
Um, but the, that song is written in the voice of my wife's mother, who lost mm. her son, as I mentioned. Um, oh, I see. And, I see. And, and, and the degree to which her faith, which is uh, has been so wonderful, you know, in helping her deal with that unbelievably traumatic loss, and and a kind of it's a it's a tribute to her and to how that has helped her, and how looking empathizing with her and looking at her situation and being like if I were in that situation how would I deal with that because I don't have that sense I you know it, it nourishes her and fills a kind of and I and I got a new appreciation for what that kind of provides for her yeah um, but because of my upbringing or because of whatever I don't have that in my own life so and then reflecting on kind of those issues in my own life I was like well when not in the song, but just thinking when I'm in those scenarios, what, what will, what will fill that place for me, or will there, will, I, yeah, et cetera. Will, I, will, how will I deal with that? I wonder if the song "Home," which, if I might say, and I don't want to shortchange anything else, and suddenly, but "Home" to me seems to be like one of the greatest caribou songs I've ever heard. I really, really oh, like you. it. Thank I really, you so much. I really like it. And I thought about home in much the same way about leaving a place for home. But what our definition as sort of mortal human beings, what does home mean? Home has a spiritual connotation as well, to leave a place for home. And I wondered if that was swimming around, uh, that sort of spiritual sense was swimming around in home as well. Well, that song is it's specifically about a friend of mine who was in a difficult, toxic relationship. Uh, and she left that relationship and both literally went home to the house that she went up grew up with her grew up in with her parents um but also yeah a sense of kind of home being you're kind of reclaiming your sense of identity outside of this kind of relationship that's kind of taken that over and you know finding herself in some sense or other and i see so that was the sense that i that i meant that in it wasn't a faith-based connotation you know people who have sort of strong religious values think of this you know, Earth is this transitory place, you mm-hmm. know, our existence here, and that home is some other, you know, spiritual plane. I just wondered if that was swimming around. That song that song was was not about that, no, but, uh, but okay. yeah, I can see how that would make sense. I'm just, I'm working on an essay about suddenly and, uh, <laughs> for my, you know, thesis. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm just trying to read it. The other thing that struck me is, like, we've already established that you want, you, you seem to have come to uh, this decision to use your own voice in a much more stark and present way than maybe you have on other Caribou records mm-hmm. uh, as, a, as a vocalist. But then when I think about some of the... Home is maybe one of the exceptions in terms of the things you've sampled that are decipherable in terms of vocals. Mm-hmm. A lot of the vocals that you have sampled here are kind of fragmented phrases, like you've chopped them in a way that I can't... Like Sonny's Time has this... It's almost like a Dilla-style chop to it with the sample piano and there's a weird vocal and I can't say I can't actually determine it almost sounds like the sample is saying gots to bounce but it's 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 messed up in such a way that I can't figure it out and New Jade has the same thing like an in in, like it's clearly a voice yeah but it's alien is that purposeful was that purposeful on some level well I mean in the moment it was very much intuitive you know and and uh not kind of there wasn't kind of some rational level that I was thinking about it oh I should <laughs> but so this is kind of the all of this the thing that I'm about to say next is a kind of post rationalization but I think that's fine you know I think that it doesn't uh invalidate it we're uh, living and, in a post rational time I think it's <laughs> totally valid for you to to make such a proclamation <laughs> um so yeah I mean I, the thing that I think I love about those kind of like disembodied atomized weird vocals where you can't the, the human voice is like the mo- the most familiar thing to us and in music the most kind of, the thing that is kind of draws us most immediately to it you know that we we kind of have the most immediate emotional connection with absolutely um, yeah and and i love in my process of making music i'm always in this place where i'm looking for things that are familiar and things that are unfamiliar and kind of having that balance between something that kind of seems comfortable, familiar, recognizable, like a very kind of direct vocal of my own where you can hear all the words or or a kind of chord sequence that's 
you know, predictable. You know what the next chord's going to be, and you can't wait to hear that resolution. I love all those things in music that that are there in our kind of cultural DNA that we've just kind of absorbed so much that we have expectations of, and they're fulfilled, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then I also want to kind of subvert those, and I, and this is something that I've kind of learned since a teenager to love about pop music, to hear pop music that has some elements that subvert a convention or, you know, take some thing that you expect and put it on its head. So in Sonny's time, for example, yeah, you it's like, it sounds like a kind of chop thing that references to me, yeah, maybe Dilla, but also kind of contemporary, kind of woozy, hip hop, R&B production. And then 808 drums, hit, uh, kick drums come in and hi-hats and there's a rap vocal, but it's incomprehensible. So th- yeah. it has that kind of it fulfills an expectation, but then subverts it. And so for me, I think that's what attracts me. I'm always looking for something that seems like, oh, I haven't heard that before. Just as somebody who's always observe, absorbing musical ideas, I want to find that thing that's like, oh, that seems like something I haven't done or maybe I haven't heard other people do, etc. As well as kind of that tightrope between that and being like, oh, that's a melody that will stick in my head because it's totally... I feel like it's f- so familiar. It should have already existed. You know, it's a, um, yeah, yeah. So it's a, that kind of balance. Do you? I mean, I was listening to it, and like I say, having sort of picked up on the emphasis on the voice, whether it's clear or or sort of you know distorted in one in one way or another, I kind of wondered if this was a record that maybe at least implicitly was about communication. Um, and the way we communicate, the things we say to each other, when we say mm-hmm. them, when we don't say them, when we should have said them. Because there seems oh, yeah. to be a fair amount of regret on here about things you wish you'd said to people or, or you know, expressed to people. Um, and now it's too late. Like you mentioned, I had the same experience with my own mother that you had with your, well, maybe not the same experience, but my mother uh, had cancer and it was, a, I didn't know what, what was coming next. And so my whole year 2018 was very very strange and a blur to me now but it did make me think of all the things i wish i had said or or done and luckily i still have an opportunity to say and do those things Um, that's good to hear yeah so uh, sorry swimming within all of what i've just said is this notion of communication and the preciousness of communication do you feel like you were expressing something about that on throughout these songs on suddenly I mean, well, the last song is about specifically that, about, you know... Cloud Song? Un- it's called Cloud Song, right? Cloud Song, yeah. It's, yeah. A, you know, kind of about the uncertainty about how long we have together with the people that we love and about saying those things and about being together and about not taking that time for granted and all those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's in here somewhere. This this emphasis yeah, on the human... So. The emphasis on the human voice... I think is maybe telling uh, again essay is coming shortly but this emphasis on the human voice feels maybe telling in a way beyond this isn't there's something going on here within that I I think uh and I Let's put it let's put it this way is that in in some of my albums in the past I was like I want to sing but but I don't know what to s- sing about like Andorra you know there were a lot of kind of fictional kind of sketches uh that I kind of ev- would evoke the kind of mood of the song this album it was the other way around it was like well this is something that i need to talk about or kind of talk right and and a lot of them you know actually here's a good example sure uh the track new jade is about again i'm as close to my wife's family as i am to my own we've been together so long and her, her sister um went through kind of catalyzed by her brother's passing uh went through a cataclysmic divorce but one that was so much for the best uh like escaped a kind of marriage that was extremely toxic and difficult for her Mm -hmm. and i just wanted to pay tribute to she's been so amazing and so brave in kind of that experience of getting out of that relationship that i just was like i need to pay tribute to her this this in some way this album's like a diary you know my albums are kind of diaries or photo albums there needs to be a song that is about her that tells her story and tells her it's it's like to her how amazing i think she is and how how much better things are going to be and Mm -hmm. how uh, yeah how proud of her i am etc etc um and and so okay to get back to your point (laughs) i wrote i wrote this song 
And it was like, I was I was starting to talk about it in interviews. And then I realized I haven't actually told her that this song is on because I felt, you know, that it's like we're very close, but there's a degree of like social awkwardness about being like, hey, can I play this song that I wrote about you? So a few weeks ago, I sent her an email and, you know, because that was maybe, I don't know, the easiest way for me to do it, explaining the whole thing and sending her the song and being like, I'm, we're, me and my wife are so proud of you and like I hope you take this in the right way. I, I, maybe I should have asked, you know, maybe I should have asked her permission to write a song about her. I don't know. Mm. Um, but anyway, so that of not having said the things that I should have said to her, but putting them in a song. So a lot of times that's part of it as well. I don't feel comfortable saying them directly. I think all of us end up in that scenario sometimes. You know, we don't say the things to our the people that we love directly, but we want to say them. And it's just doesn't it's hard to get them out or something. Um, so. But this has been a vehicle through which I've been able to do that. And then subsequently being like, you know, told her about this song and she was, you know, I, I hopefully flattered and excited about it and, and, and you know, liked that gesture rather than being <laughs> upset and feeling like I was, I, I wouldn't be telling this story now if she'd been upset about it. Basically, she was, you know, very pleased because she's also having come out of this scenario, the situation is like, wonderfully empowered and feeling really great and stuff and so it's fascinating it's fascinating yeah. so suddenly yeah. works as a communications platform for you to speak directly or indirectly i suppose to to people you want to express things to you're also using it as a, a vehicle to perhaps have uh, imaginary conversations on behalf of people who are struggling so there's a yep. but it, but yep. by and large it seems like you're bringing a community of people uh, close to you into this record and they're populating these songs oh yeah absolutely and c can i i mean sh i should say that when i released my first record way back when none of these kind of thoughts or considerations i i always loved music for the kind of musical elements the kind of I instrumental or melodic or rhythmic or harmonic things i never thought that i was going to be having I mean I know it's to some degree a kind of cliche in people's progression through the years of recording music that, that it becomes more personal and more yeah. intimate etc I, I never thought that I was going to be that person I mean you know like at that point I was listening to Aphex Twin records and you don't certainly don't listen to new Aphex Twin <laughs> albums and think oh yeah I know he, you know he's talking about this and that in his personal life so it, it's it surprised me that to the degree the wish that I feel that this is important and for me to to do but it, it just it does it feels like it, it feels like i couldn't have avoided doing it it was so deeply embedded in my experiences yeah and i appreciate that i i had invoked dilla in talking about sunny's time and you kind of deflected it to say well maybe dilla but maybe something more contemporary and, and hip-hop so i do want to take a moment to actually ask you about the music on suddenly we've mostly been talking about maybe the lyrical content and and your attack your approach as a singer but in terms of the music, making music in 2020 as Caribou, having, you know, pioneered so many things for so many of us, you know, you, you, you've become this sort of leader in the kind of music you make. And whatever that kind of music is, it's very hard to actually categorize what it is you do. But in terms of approaching music making for this record, what were you thinking about? Like, were you thinking about contemporary sounds and the way that people are making music? I can't really... I can't really pin you down still, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out where you were coming from yep. in terms of making music because it's not a particularly upbeat record it, it, compared to some of your others. It doesn't. I'm thinking of things like when Melody Day burst out of the speakers, I was taken away, like I was just blasted out of my seat. And then yep. this record begins with Sister, which yep. is very much the opposite. So I'm yep. just kind of wondering tonally what you were kind of after here. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, thank you for saying nice things about me, which I'm not sure I agree with but it's uh, certainly not the way that i i see myself but uh, it's my show dan you have to agree <laughs> these are my opinions and they're, your, they're not they're more than opinions they're the truth it's your essay you can really, <laughs> um uh, I'm, I'm pushing for a b minus at this point yeah <laughs> um i i i mean i the one thing that i w try and communicate to people is that how confused and lack of a sense of direction how at a loss for a sense of direction I am in the process of making it still after all these years of making music. I think there's this kind of, 
sensibility, uh, there's this kind of uh, impression that you get when you just listen to the finished product of the music that people have made, any yeah. artist you like, you're like, oh, this is full of kind of intention and they, there's it's kind of cohesive and it's wrapped up in this kind of package and it makes all make sense. They must have really known what they were setting out to do and it all came together. And f- that is, I hope that my albums ha- give that impression, but yeah. that is not the impression that I get have on the inside. It's like, it's almost, you know, I almost feel starting again from another, uh, you know, having finished the last album and starting in, like, how do I do this again? You know, mm-hmm. every mm-hmm. single time it almost feels like starting from scratch. And the only way I know how to do it is just chase the things that are musically exciting to me and let the kind of personal stuff get in there by osmosis or just by because it's unavoid, unavoidable that they'll be that'll be in there. But I'm I am um I mean this this album's quite diverse. That's one thing yeah, to say about absolutely. it. There's lots yeah, and yeah. lots of different kinds of music on here, and that's because my taste is diver- diverse. You know, people know that about me. I like lots of different old and new music, and so I'm kind of whether it's like making a track out of an old soul record like Home, or whether it's making something that's a kind of synthesized texture or a kind of upbeat house kind of thing. I'm just following like a kind of thrill that I get either from a melody or from a musical idea, a juxtaposition of things. And that that definitely comes from both old and new music. But one, okay. one thing one thing that has happened to me uh you know, I've still you I think you hear it very much on this record. I've still got the kind of record collector thing about me, you know. There's yeah, like yeah, yeah. old samples, old textures, things that reference like a kind of law, you know, music that was eccentric music that was lost and is being rediscovered by people, whether that's through sampling or just trying to capture that, imagining that the music I'm making is going to have that same character or something. But then there's also, I, I starting with Swim, I think, and uh, it's not that I'm not proud of the albums before that, but I kind of thought Swim really, really very directly related to the kind of contemporary club, underground club world in London at that time. It was a kind of exciting time in that world. And that's what the music came out of. And it, it felt so nice on its release subsequently to see like, oh, yeah, that fits in with the kind of musical conversation of that time. Yeah, It's an album that will like relate to those that moment. And people will, I think it resonated with people because it felt of that time. And so there is a desire for me since then to make sure it doesn't have to be, I'm not talking about like hopping on a kind of trend or bandwagon or whatever's hot at that moment, but it's more like I want the music that I make to be part of the conversation about music at that time. Because some of the music that I've made has been very much of another time. You know, Andorra was very much like referencing 60s and 60s right. uh, psychedelic symphonic pop, which is great. I'm I'm proud of that. But I, I, I hope that this album kind of somehow speaks to right now sounds like either it's 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 kind of something like slightly slightly new about it although there's also you know i guess whenever i try and talk about this album <laughs> i realize i'm i'm talking about some of the tracks but the other tracks like contradict exactly what i'm what i'm saying so anyway but i, I do want my music to feel kind of contemporary in that sense and that it is of this moment that i'm making it in well it does feel of this moment in in, in every way you just described it's it's this moment that we're in is 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 kind of super saturated with different kinds of sounds, and I think you've yep. you've always been yep. good at tapping into the moment with your releases. Um, this one is out on Merge Records uh, as well as uh, still, I believe, is it on? Yeah, that's it. It's on Merge Records, right? In in North America, it's on Merge, and in Europe, it's in City Slang. They're the same independent labels I've been working with since Andorra, so for thirteen years now. Nice, and it's wonderful to work with. Yeah, like minded. You know, you know, super capable and wonderful and everything, but also just people who kind of get what there's no pressure to like make an album of a certain kind. There's no pressure even to like finish an album by a certain date, which maybe would be helpful to me sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel very much supported in the kind of to make the decisions that I want to make uh, working with those labels. Okay, well, if there's a song we can go out on from suddenly here, Dan, um, could you pick one for us? Oh man, uh, this is with. Also, here's another thought: when we were picking the singles for this album, 
you know, there's certainly some of the ones that we chose were more immediate and catchy than others. But every time we were thinking about, oh, could this be the single? We were like, wait a minute, that's really, it doesn't capture, it only captures one aspect of the album. So, uh, and that's true of all the tracks on the the album, I think. Um, yeah. It, what kind of mo- what kind of mood are you in? What kind well, of- I, I referenced home. Uh, yeah, that's well, that's that's one I, I quite enjoy. Let's play that one. OK, we'll go out on home from suddenly by by Caribou. Dan, this was such a pleasure to get to speak with you. I, I thank you for the time and I wish you the best of luck with everything going forward. It's been lovely to talk to you again. Thanks for having me on. what she pleases Cause she's happy on her own And she picks up all the pieces She's going home Baby, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home Yeah, she's going home Baby, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home Very special thanks to Dan Snaith, a.k.a. Caribou, for appearing on this, the 530th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One network and is available on all iOS and Android podcast platforms and also on things like Spotify and YouTube and Audio Boom and everything else as well. If you can't find an episode that you've heard about and are looking for and it's not on any of those platforms, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my semi hyper hyper semi regularly scheduled newsletter i'll get one of those out soon i don't know why i don't know if i know the password to the newsletter thing i must have it somewhere but we moved and i can't find anything anyway if you want to learn more about uh, all that stuff and and me go to my website vishkana.com i know the password to that website also you can like creative control on facebook or follow the show on twitter at vish creative or follow me directly at Vishkana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Again, there is a $6 and higher tier now, which gets you exclusive uh, content, exclusive access to content that I've been posting on the Patreon page, and I'm going to do one of those soon, now that I've freed up time. You know, doing these as you're listening to this Caribou episode, and if you, if you go back a bit, you'll notice there's been a few weeks now where I've done two episodes a week, instead of just the one, which I'm trying to stick to just one a week, but then topical stuff happens where I feel like I got to get stuff out. It is 
certain time and I put all this pressure on myself and I don't know why. It, dude, who cares? I should be doing once a week, but every once in a while I do two a week and it really throws me off. I'm back to once a week in March, so I'll have time to tend to the Patreon exclusive content, which you can learn more about at patreon.com slash creative control. So please do that. Thanks again to Pete's Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support for this show. As always, thanks to my friend Jim Guthrie for lending me some music for this show. He's a wonderful musician and a good hang. You can learn more about him at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you very much for listening to this episode with Caribou. And perhaps uh, now that you're here, if you've never been here before, welcome. Uh, go forth. Check out some old episodes. Go uh, subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends about the podcast. Do what you like, as Digital Underground once famously said. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this show. I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now.